Hi there, stranger. Welcome to the video in which I'll be talking about the street gang. That's not what it's called. I'll get the full title up. Street gang colon how we got to sesame street this is a documentary uh, released december of last year so a couple months ago and it's something that i've been meaning to get to basically since i saw the trailer for it in november i think i was telling people about it and saying oh that looks kind of neat there's a sesame street documentary the trailer hyped it up pretty hard uh the trailer i also feel was a little bit misleading in terms of giving a sense of the direction of the whole documentary but if you haven't guessed by now this is is a documentary about Sesame Street. One of the more interesting things to say about it is that it kind of attempts to cover many, many different aspects of the creation of the show, the development of the show, up until about 1990 when Jim Henson died, and then they basically wrap everything up from there, so it doesn't delve into modern day Sesame Street at all. And I would argue that even a lot of the stuff that it does cover, it tends to to feel a little rushed and piecemeal. I want to talk about some of this stuff in more detail, uh, which is what I'm going to do right now. Let's let's do it. Okay, like a lot of people, it was on TV when I was growing up. I saw modern episodes. Remember when Oscar's worm friend pet went to space? I remember that storyline. That was a big deal. That was like a television event at the time. I saw tons of reruns, obviously, and in, in, it seems that in the newer episodes they were producing in the 90s, early 2000s, that they were still using using a lot of animated segments and, and other things from much older seasons of the show. It's obviously one of the longest running television shows in history, if I'm remembering that correctly. I was a fan of the Muppets, both on, you know, the Sesame Street Muppets and the ones that we saw on the Muppet Show from a pretty early age. Also, just a lot of the animation that we saw in Sesame Street, specifically the pinball animation. There's, there's a number of different sequences for different numbers, right? Those are fantastic, and I think they might might have been done by Nelvana. I'm going to be talking about in my video on Canadian animation, which I promise is actually going to come out at some point. I have generally very positive memories of Sesame Street. An interesting connection to a point that they make in the documentary is something that came up when roughly two years ago that I released my video on Summer Camp Island. That was one of the first videos I had on the channel. And the whole concept there was adult-friendly animation, animated entertainment that works more or less equally well for both kids and adults. And after I released that video, I think it was my dad. Yes. Yeah, talking to my parents about it and my dad said something along the lines of that really resonated in terms of the early years of Sesame Street as well because he was saying at least like personally even if he, when he was like a teenager and, and in college and stuff that uh, and I think his parents as well like were fascinated at the very least by Sesame Street. At the very least, it didn't feel like as annoying and awful and cheap as a lot of other children's entertainment. And that's something they expressed pretty early on in this documentary is that there was such a huge push behind the development of the show to make it something of substance. They did a decent amount of research in terms of what kinds of education they could deliver to children using advertising techniques, which is a fascinating angle to the whole story too. And they also mentioned that Sesame Street, when it first premiered, was pretty big with, like, college students specifically. Apparently, college-age kids were also the people really into the early, early Jim Henson Muppet work, which he did on, like, late-night shows, and he did a bunch of uh, commercial campaigns with different Muppets characters, early versions of Kermit the Frog, stuff like that. So that's kind of neat. It's kind of neat to hear from different sources now that this was, in essence, uh, adult-friendly animation, certainly in the early early days. We could maybe argue that for contemporary Sesame Street as well, but I'm not as familiar with it, so I can't really speak to that. This is a documentary. It's it's directed by a woman named Marilyn Agrello. Agrello? I'm, I'm not familiar with this person's work. A number of other documentaries, as well as just feature films. Uh, what, there's a documentary about kids competing in a ballroom dancing competition. Uh, uh, what looks like sort of a feel-good movie about math and education. Based on very little actual information of Agrello's other work, it seems to be pretty lighthearted stuff overall. If that's an incorrect assumption, please let me know. Based on that impression, I would say some similar things about Street Gang. It does feel very 
very light. And I'm not saying that it shies away from larger topics or issues or some of the nitty gritty kind of stuff that the show got into. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But I think maybe part of my slight issue with the documentary, because overall I did enjoy myself watching it. It was a fun watch. It is an easy watch. It got a lot of interesting information out of it. So some wonderful behind the scenes footage that would probably be pretty hard to track down otherwise. But I think maybe it just has to do with the, the sheer breadth of information and and legacy and, and history and specific team members behind Sesame Street that it may have just been too much. It just feels like a massive amount of stuff is being communicated to the viewer over the course of just under two hours. It can feel a little bit too light on its feet. It's talking about the incredible impact of the show and how it was entertainment of substance, but then, weirdly, this documentary doesn't feel like the most substantial thing. That's an odd pairing, isn't it? I have to wonder, I don't know, because Sesame Street is officially an HBO slash Warner Media slash Time Warner property. This is released through HBO Max. Maybe, maybe there was a little bit of nudging in terms of, this is baseless speculation, obviously, just thinking out loud here, but it does kind of feel like portray Sesame Street in the best light possible, and that's probably not too challenging. That's not insincere. Obviously, literally millions of people have incredibly positive feelings about Sesame Street. Street, the positive impact of the show, especially in the early years, is just evident. But I don't know. And this is where I'll talk about that trailer again, because the trailer really seems to focus on the integration aspect of Sesame Street. Sadly, this is incredibly sad, of course, but this is part of American history, obviously. It was considered kind of like edgy and, and forward thinking and progressive at the time to include black actors and actors of color in general on a major television show and specifically a show for kids. There was a significant amount of friction around that idea. Well, I guess they just highlight that a lot of stations in Mississippi just refused to broadcast it, citing complaints from viewers. And I guess that was enough for them to just be like, oh, okay, well then <laughs> never mind. We're just not going to show it to anybody. Pretty low, pretty despicable. The trailer really made it seem like that was going to be the focus. Like it was going to, this documentary was going to zero in on on those moments, those early years of the show, when it was controversial and it was forward thinking and they were trying to have really positive representation, they were, they were trying to do, uh, do things that are now considered very progressive, or I guess in today's day and age considered baseline progressive, and it's really not. That's really just one little slice of the whole documentary, and even then, it still kind of feels rushed, and I, I don't think they're skipping over information there. I just feel like, again, and there was so much to cover, there just wasn't room for it, I guess, or something, or they didn't have much else to say about the topic. Um, there's also a weird, a very brief moments where they talk about the the short-lived Muppet character Roosevelt Franklin, who was specifically a black character created by the actor who originally played Gordon on the show, Matthew Robinson Jr., and he was, he was very involved in, like, black activism, civil rights movement of the time. He really saw Sesame Street as a major opportunity for positive representation. Uh, apparently, uh, in the words of the documentary, <laughs> more or less, plenty of black parents around the country were not fans of this character, felt it was too one-dimensional, it was a very simplified representation. So not only did the character of Roosevelt Franklin get removed from the show, they just say that Matthew Robinson left the show and then they just move on. And they're like, and then we got this actor to play Gordon. So like, <laughs> did he leave on good terms? Did he leave of his own volition? Was, was he sort of pushed off the show? It seems like there was a lot more to dig into there that they just 
just didn't? That's my impression anyway. Who knows whether there is more information to cover in that area. But that's just one small example of how it sometimes feels like it's skipping over some really juicy stories, which in documentary filmmaking, you you want those. You want as many of those as possible. And whatever the strongest ones are, those that's what you feature. But here, it just kept skipping around. It also clarified that like Jim Henson and, and Frank Oz and, and the Muppets guys were not necessarily the driving forces behind the entire show. They highlight some of the original creators and, and directors, uh, specifically Joan Cooney was heading up the project, I think from the very beginning. And then we had John Stone, longtime director of Sesame Street. He was apparently extremely crucial to the development and success of the show overall. So that was great. I'm, I'm happy to have that information. These are not names that I had really heard before in discussions about Sesame Street. And I do think a lot of people tend to associate Sesame Street so heavily with the Muppets and with Jim Henson that it's nice to actually get some information about the people who were actually running things. Henson was integral, of course. Uh, the Muppets in general were one of the most popular parts of the show, especially with young kids, but that's not the whole story, right? So that, that is something I appreciated getting. But then it's weird again because it's like, okay, they knew that they had to touch on Jim Henson and Frank Oz early in the documentary, and then they stop, and they talk about some other things, and some other major events, and other major actors, players, etc., writers, songwriters, and then to cap things off, they go back to Jim Henson and Frank Oz and the Muppets and how much kids loved him and the death of Jim Henson and they have some very emotional footage from the I guess it was a broadcast funeral they had for Jim Henson I'm not saying that they shouldn't have included any of that stuff but it did feel a little strange and overall I think I think this tips off one of the larger things happening with the whole documentary and something that I've kind of mentioned already but just the idea idea that the goal of this doc is not necessarily to flood you with information and, and new footage and to educate you on the history and legacy of, of Sesame Street. It felt more like it was there to remind everybody that Sesame Street was so great and to appeal to their personal emotions that are directly related to Sesame Street. Because if you're like me, if you watched the earlier seasons of the show, you're going Going to probably feel some kind of uh, heartstring pulling at some point during the documentary. You'll see a moment that you really remember, hear a song that you had memorized as a kid. You'll see Jim Henson doing interviews and just think, oh, he looks like a real nice guy. Some Somewhere along the way, you're going to feel really emotional and they cap things off with this, like, I think it's already like a viral clip. On, on YouTube of Big Bird singing It's Not Easy Being Green at Jim Henson's funeral. It felt strangely cloying, and I don't really appreciate that coming from a documentary. And I, I get it. I've been around the block a few times. I know that no documentary can actually be completely objective and just deliver the truth straight to viewers. No, there's always intervention from the team behind the doc. Any editing immediately obscures and transforms footage and and constructs a new narrative that might be slightly different from the actual narrative. I get that, but here it just kind of felt like it went a little too far in the direction of let's just say a bunch of positive things about Sesame Street and make people remember the good times with Sesame Street. And that's it. Like I said, I did get some information out of the experience. I did see some wonderful behind the scenes footage that I really, really enjoyed. And that's kind of it. In fact, was Frank Oz even interviewed for this thing? He's still around. He's very much still around. I don't think they had any contemporary interviews with Frank Oz. I mean, correct me again if I'm if if they did, it was very brief. Yeah, it felt detached in a weird way um, from typical documentary structure, and it didn't necessarily deliver what I would probably want from a documentary about this kind of project. It did cover a lot of ground technically, it touched on a lot of different topics and people, but I never really felt like it went deep enough to give a real satisfying look or a, a new perspective on anything at all. And that's kind of disappointing. Slightly disappointing. It doesn't feel irresponsible. I, I'm not saying that it's inaccurate or anything like that. It just felt a little bit like a puff piece. And... Um...
it's not really what you want from a documentary, is it? Did they just see all the, you know, the thing from a few years back where they had all that Fred Rogers stuff? You had the Fred Rogers documentary, and then you had the Tom Hanks movie that no one remembers. And it's like, oh yeah, there's so much goodwill for these like really kind-hearted people who worked in children's entertainment that was actually educational and, and caring and fun and creative and challenging. They were like, oh, we have, well, we have Sesame Street. We got the rights to that. Uh, should we talk that up? Could we get that to be an Oscar nomination? Actually, has this been nominated for an Oscar? Spider-Man No Way Home is snubbed. Oh yeah, it was snubbed. Jesus Christ. Just a list. That's all I want. I haven't heard of any of these. Don't look up. Really? Really? This gets documentary, Mike. Just go ahead. Yeah, Dune for cinematography. Yeah, I mean, nope, it's not here. It's not here. It's, it, it didn't get a nomination, Oscar nomination for documentary, feature documentary. So if that was the plan, it didn't work out. And so what we're left with is what I would consider to be a slightly subpar documentary. If you're into Sesame Street in some form, have positive thoughts about it. I do recommend watching it if you already have HBO Max. Like I said, fun little moments fun footage, but yeah, lacking substance. Felt a little weak, but that's where I'll stop. Thanks for stopping by.